Hi, Dominique, and uh, welcome again to another week of uh, key events. Uh, sorry to everyone uh, last week. Uh, I would say that we missed because I was traveling, but also I unfortunately got a little bit sick on, on the, while traveling, but I feel great right now. So very excited to to kind of get into it as we always do. How's everything in LA, Dominic? How are you doing? Oh, everything is, uh, you know, the sun is shining, the birds are singing. Well, maybe not so, but the, it's a beautiful uh, autumn uh, day. So it's great. Yeah. Awesome. Let's start as we, as we always like to do for the from the previous week. At least to me, where usually it's kind of either Fed comments or some type of economic data that really kind of drove markets, and we we can kind of debate how surprising. Obviously, there were some key important data, especially on kind of inflation indicators this this past week. But clearly, the you know big tech uh, earnings were big drivers and maybe even affected the kind of fixed income market. Um, and obviously, there's other central bank activity, kind of like Canada, I guess, and Australia, where they've kind of stepped down from bigger hikes. And the question of, is this a prelude for the Fed uh, as well? And I think I think we've been discussing like, you know, basically we've been on your, let's call it like locomotive train for the last several months, probably since Jackson Hole. But I would say Brainard maybe put a little bit of a kind of slowdown in that. And now it seems like it's not two-way risk. It's maybe at least like 80-20. So there's at least some comments about either overseas or daily another one. Yeah. So so first, first, I guess before we get into next week, how would you, anything stand out from this previous week? Any data and, and of course, market reaction? So the data was a bit ambiguous uh, on the GDP. Uh, we had a rebound as expected, but basically uh, a rebound due to special factors, the most volatile component of GDP, inventories, external trade, government, these were down a lot in uh, the first half of the year. And that's why we had negative GDP growth. And they normalized in Q3, as you'd expect. And so we had positive GDP growth. But if you strip those out, uh, I mean, the things that economists like to call final sales to domestic private uh, purchaser, Basically, GDP stripped of this volatile component. Uh, it was slower Q, uh, quarter on quarter than uh, in the first and second quarter, still positive, uh, but slower. Uh, then we had some data on inflation and wages, which was basically as bad as expected. So no upside, generally no upside surprise. But the consensus was for uh, outcomes that was way above what's needed to go back to 2% inflation. And the last thing we had, which in my mind was the most intriguing and perhaps the market didn't pay enough attention, we're getting a sense that uh, the recovery uh, is uh, regaining its mojo and uh, becoming more self-sustaining. One indicator I like to look at is uh, really household income, excluding government transfers, because obviously government's transfers were enormous during right. the pandemic, scrambled everything. So uh, we're getting a sense that it is going back to its pre-pandemic uh, trend, which is good news for growth. Uh, consistent with my views that growth could have bottomed out in the third, third quarter, uh, but of course, bad news for the Fed. But a, a lot of like you're usually out there on, on consensus, and and I think a, as we've discussed, a lot of the you know the the economic world is probably now continuing slowly to move to your view. I think we agree that inflation is very sticky, and and still. In some cases, I wouldn't just say in the U.S. and Europe as well, is maybe even going higher or at least holding at a high level. Let's talk about core. But there, I thought I'm surprised you're saying it because I thought there's kind of a prevailing view that risks of the recession of a recession are really starting to increase significantly, and that there's cracks on the growth side. But you actually think you're not so sure about that, and you actually think that growth will stay fairly strong and maybe even strengthen slightly from here. Oh, uh, could strengthen, and the reason is is very simple. Actually, it's two reasons. The 
first one is uh, fiscal consolidation is behind us. Uh, last fiscal year that ended in September, we had a decrease in the deficit equivalent to eight percentage point of GDP, which is cr crazy, enormous, enormous, find the word you like for it, which of course follows the an increase uh, in the deficit that was equally uh, <laughs> abnormous. Abnormal. Right. Uh, but some of that so, we think is from negative real rates. No, no, no. It was just a policy response to the just, crisis, just less basically spending, just to less the spending pandemic. The previous year. Yeah. Oh, you mean the consolidation this year? Yeah. yeah. Less spending, higher revenue. The deficit is probably going to increase uh, this year. Uh, because uh, growth uh, is, uh, is is flowing, it's going back to trend. Uh, also, this extraordinary uh, uh, consolidation reflected in part the, the extraordinary recovery. But the bottom line is the worst of the fiscal consolidation is behind us. So the negative fiscal impulse on growth is only going to get uh, smaller. Okay. And against that, you have a household who have like the lowest ever or lowest for the past 40 years of since before the oil shock savings rate. And this is super important because uh, consumption is 70% of, um, uh, of the US economy. And what is going on is that despite the decline in household wealth, household wealth uh, they are not saving uh, more, which by the way is what I had predicted. And so we have this super low savings rate, which could fall more. What it is, it's basically people still spending the government money uh, that they got, which was so enormous. And I think that's what people, market participants are missing, is that there is an enormous hangover from the pandemic stimulus, which is still there because of the size of that, of that stimulus, which is unlike anything that had ever been done uh, you know, since that. But when, when I think we've talked about this a few weeks ago. So when does that become concerning that, you know, there's $20,000 in savings and then $30,000 in credit card debt. And then it becomes, okay, fine. You're expecting a raise. There, there's a point where eventually that's going to start hitting the real economy. Definitely. So where, you know, so we have super strong uh, balance sheet on the part of the consumer, still very large net worth. Uh, because of housing or because of the actual because money in the bank? Low debt, housing, money in the bank, still uh, some stocks, uh, which are, of course, getting hit. But the key thing is that unemployment is still very low. Wow. And so, so people are comfortable about their jobs. Exactly. And they may even be getting raises, but yeah. They are getting raises. And that's exactly why I think that, you know, the end game is a recession, because that's the only way to bring uh, price increases and wage increases from about 7% now to 2%. Uh, but before we get there, we could have a pickup uh, in growth, which of course will not uh, please the Fed. I think. And I guess, yeah, I mean, markets seem to be, I mean, do, do you agree that the markets are pricing in, if the Fed was a 10 out of 10 on like, we're going to kill inflation no matter what, there's going to be pain, we don't care, to an 8 out of 10 over the last two weeks? Or, or do you not believe that? That's my impression. That's what I'm asking. So we need to be super specific about the time period because right now things are easy for the Fed. Unemployment is very low. Growth is very strong. They can keep hiking. There's no pain other than inflation. But in terms of, uh, you know, pivoting uh, and pivoting because they don't have the guts to do what it takes to bring down inflation, that we will find later. Uh, right. We'll find basically those guys have no clue on why inflation is not responding to uh, policy uh, tightening. And so they tend to react to the last data print. The, the underlying macro drivers of inflation are still super strong. So it's reasonable to explain that we won't see much of a decline uh, in the next CPI print uh, following the meeting next week. And on that basis, I think they'll still do 75 and we'll have to raise a bit um, the terminal rate. But we won't find out if they really have the guts to do 
uh, what's needed to bring down inflation until it gets painful. And let's remember the uh, historical president, uh, Volcker, in 1980, actually let go of tightening in April because he could see uh, economic pain, he could see unemployment going up. I think it's a little too soon uh, yeah. to worry, but I think it's definitely an open question. It's not my uh, base case scenario. My base case scenario is I do what Congress mandates them to do, in part for political reasons. But, but what do you think about the December meeting now? Because you, 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 I remember you saying, even you said, there's no way they should stop. I'm paraphrasing. Remember, like I think they should continue, but I think they probably should move to 50 from December onwards. And then, you know, it, it, let's say they do another five from December onwards, that's still another 250 basis points, way so more than the market would assume. Sure. But, yeah. So I guess I broke one of my rules, which was a very bad idea. So one of my cardinal rules is to not express a normative view on what the Fed does, but try to look at it from their perspective. Um, I think it's more helpful to, to investors. Um, and so from their perspective, um, they don't really understand what's going on because their models are breaking down. So they, instead of telling us we don't have a clue, they are telling us uncertainty is exceptional, which I think is a bit silly. It's another way of saying we have no clue. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, in fact, I was watching an interview of a Governor Cook by Adam Posen, who is yes. the head of the PIIE, so this very hallowed macro think tank in Washington, D.C. And uh, she was, of course, invoking exceptional uncertainty. And he politely asked her, how long do you expect this exceptional uncertainty to last? Which shows that I'm not the only one to uh, <laughs> their, their ability to understand what is going on. But uh, so from the, back to their perspective, they're really lost. They don't have an anchor. They don't have a good narrative. They've been wrong. They've been terribly wrong on transitory. Then this year, they thought inflation would uh, stabilize. And if you look at core, it's been stabilizing, but now it's going up again. So what do you do when that happens? You just try to stay very close to the data, meaning you react to the last uh, print. And that's why I think the hawks are likely to prevail and go for yeah, those prevail, yeah. Because if yeah. you think about it in terms of uh, risk, you know, risk management, the loss uh, of reputation for the Fed uh, would be enormous if, you know, they started too slow when inflation uh, was uh, accelerating. Right. So you know, unless they have a good data. To... It's more like credibility or or um, um, political as opposed to risk management. It's more. <laughs> oh, oh, no question. I mean, this is how they think. And also the really important thing to realize is that if they announce a pivot now, you will have a really big easing of financial conditions, which is exactly. Uh, it, yeah. Yeah. So. Yes. So, I mean, you know, I can always be wrong, but from their perspective, it seems to me that uh, the Hawks still have a good case in terms of uh, financial condition easing too soon uh, and in terms of the data not showing the all clear far from it. Okay, it's a great segue to, uh, I mean, we're already kind of talking about the Fed this coming week. So maybe first let's um, I mean, do you want to talk about the Fed? Do you want to talk about data coming out? So let's let, let me quickly recap on the Fed. Uh, yeah. 75 basis points is what's priced in. Sure. And interestingly, interestingly enough, you know, the Fed before the last meeting intimated that uh, no more forward guidance, but they can't let go of it. And that is actually a very deep issue with the Fed, which is that they try to manage the market too much. And uh, in my last preview, I quoted a former governor who wrote uh, in 2014 that this uh, trying to manage the market reaction is, uh, is completely uh, um, completely self-defeating. Uh, 75 basis points this time around. And I think Chair Powell is going to refuse to say anything about a pivot. 
and probably push back even against the idea of a pivot. But a pivot announcement at this time would be very premature. Just to check on something. Sure. Is a step down to 50 in December, is that, would the market or you consider that some type of pivot? Or a pivot is like them stopping or cutting. So that's also super important. <laughs> uh, the, the trick for the Fed is to do 50 of the, in December uh, while convincing... 50 in December or after December? Would be, if they want to do 50 in December, the trick is to convince uh, the market that uh, 50 is not a prelude to 25, zero... Fine an eventual uh, cut. And so um, I'm sure like everybody else, you read the Wall Street Journal, Nick Timirao said an article where he suggested that uh, if they wanted to uh, go slower, which I mean, to answer your question would be tactical, not a change in the terminal rate of the Fed fund right. rate, but taking more time to go there. They could to convince uh, the market that they were not softer, they could raise the terminal rate, which to me seems a little, I mean, to be frankly, a little silly, because raising the terminal rate means that they would go for a more hawkish uh, trajectory. So in order to ease tactically, they would have to uh, increase the hawkishness of their old policy, which seems a little bit inconsistent, which goes back to Jeremy Stein's, so the Fed governor and his 2014 speech, where he said that we can't, the Fed can't manage the market. It doesn't work. The yeah. Fed should just try to do what's needed to manage, to fulfill its mandate uh, and to be transparent with the market. And the rest is uh, beyond their responsibility. I would say the other thing that is uh, uh, also uh, against uh, slowing to 50 uh, in December um, um, is an uh, announcement by the US Treasury of uh, possible buybacks to increase uh, the liquidity of the treasury market. So the, I mean, the key uh, concern of the Fed having watched what happened in the UK is of course uh, having to, uh, I mean, making sure they don't have to stop and reverse uh, QT which would be, again, a loss of credit. Oh, so you think if they go to 50, actually one result can be just the back end goes, yields go much higher uh, and or, forcing people to sell and I then was, it can make it worse. I, I was thinking more than uh, going to 50. One reason for going to 50 is that it would be easier uh, for the market to absorb and there might Fine. be fewer issues with liquidity in the treasury market. But I think these issues are more likely to be handled through non-monetary uh, initiatives. So for instance, this buyback, there is also a talk of regulatory relief, of excluding uh, treasuries and uh, reserves from the computation of uh, capital of leverage ratios and, and so on. Okay, so, so then banks could take cap cash they have on their balance sheet to buy treasuries. Exactly. Exactly. And even, and, uh, you know, one thing which is in-, in So that would increase curve inversion or, or no? Um, it depends where it happens. But before we get there, one thing which is really important to mention is this shortage of collateral. Bilal uh, published a note, I think a week or so, about it showing some evidence of collateral shortage, which is very consistent with um, issues in the non-bank finance uh, financial sector. Basically, the banks fund themselves um, with deposit. Non-banks fund themselves with borrowings, uh, collateralized borrowing. And he showed a series of data, an increase in fails, for instance, that suggests uh, um, an issue possibly with collateral sh shortages. In this context, actually, if you think about QT, QT could very well be a positive thing because it would uh, release more collateral in the in the uh, in the treasury market in the repo, for the use in the repo market. So there are many moving parts. Uh, to these uh, treasury liquidity issues. And I'm not at all convinced that slowing uh, hikes to 50 uh, is how the administration and the Fed are planning to, to tackle yeah. it. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. And then on the, the data coming out next week. So um, yeah, uh, what do you think? What's key? Are you out of consensus on, on any any of the data? Sure. Um, yeah. It's, it's NFP uh, week. So my Friday, my Friday gone, 
no yeah. uh, biking on the beach on NF on NFP uh, Fridays. Uh, I think the consensus is a little too uh, pessimistic on the headline number. Uh, I think it, people have uh, lowered their expectation uh, in part because of a uh, hurricane uh, Ian. It was on October 4th. The data week, the data collection week for um, NFPs is a week that contains the 12th day of the month. So there is a possible impact, but I think it's unlikely to be as strong uh, Uh, as what uh, uh, the consensus is showing. And I'm wondering if there is not a sort of a view that growth is going to slow further uh, in uh, Q4. And that's what the consensus is reflecting. So I will be very interested uh, in, part, in that number. I mean, obviously, I'm always interested. But I suspect the surprise this quarter could be a rebound in growth. But, you know, let's see. Rebound in growth. So just saying payrolls so, picked up. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking uh, about uh, the employment data and freight. Okay, and then anything else? I guess we also. Um... Well, I mean that's uh, that's really uh, the the main thing. Um, I think you know between that and the Fed, it's enough. It's going to be enough to keep uh, everybody very busy, um, including uh, including us. Anything else? That uh, everyone, I mean, it's a lot. Uh, well, I mean, we are getting close to the uh, elections, uh, obviously. Uh, so the um, uh, Democrats are losing a bit of ground. Uh, they had a debate in Pennsylvania, which was one of the swing uh, states where they had actually a, a good uh, a chance of uh, picking the seat back from the GOP. Unfortunately, uh, they picked a candidate who has had a stroke and was not uh, fully recovered. And that was painfully obvious uh, in the debate. And it, there is a good chance that, uh, you know, that debate lost them Pennsylvania. So um, the chances, I would say over the week, the chances of a GOP takeover of the Senate have, have increased. Yeah, I said like Georgia now, super close. Yeah. I don't know if it's Arizona is also pretty close. Exactly. Um, I, I was reading something. So just one question on it is, let's assume the Republicans get the House, which is pretty high delta of happening. Does it matter if the Republicans have the Senate or doesn't really matter them? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, what they can do, they can block the administration uh, appointments that has to be Senate. Okay, that has to be proved in the Senate, yeah. But you would have hoped that two years into its mandate, this administration has made all of its appointments, or it could well, still step through the light one, duck. One could be your buddy, um, uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Hasn't she said... Or, or she wouldn't, she'd leave in after four years, not two. Uh, so there is this rumor uh, that she would be let go uh, after the midterms. Uh, I don't know. I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference between because uh, since the Republicans are going to get uh, the, the House, they will have a de facto veto on, um, uh, on the budget. Right. So... We'll see. Uh, yeah. We'll see. Okay. Um, well, awesome. Uh, thank you again. And uh, for you know, before we go, I just want to just quickly go through as we started going through the last few weeks for our prime clients. You know, kind of was some of the favorite things, which if people have missed, I would definitely check out. Uh, John Tierney put out a few amazing uh, reports on earnings. He also has revamped how he's looking at asset allocation and kind of sectors of overweight, underweight. Um, so for active investors, for private wealth, family offices, I would absolutely check that out. Some great stuff. Obviously for crypto, Davir had had a, an update. I think a lot of the focus was on Ethereum, but just general crypto, what's driving it? Uh, what are the risks? Uh, including, I think, some stuff around regulatory. What do we think from the macro factors, as we always like to do. And obviously, in today's environment, extremely influential. This week was another influential uh, factor where yields kind of tempered a little bit, as Dominique and, both, and I both agree, for a short term, um, but also outside of tech that a lot of equities did well and, and crypto did well on the back of that. Another cool one for just in general, for, for any of our clients, was a, a super cool thing of, you know, everyone 
thinks it's crazy about the, um, China's uh, COVID policy and, and why this is continuing. But and we're, we're not validating in any way. But if you see Taiwan, that's kind of a, given up on a similar strategy several months ago, they, they are definitely seeing the effects of some of it. So that's a, it's a Bilal put a report out, I think, on, on Wednesday or Thursday. I would definitely recommend people to check that out. And for a professional um, clients, uh, first of all, thank you, as, as always. But Bilal's thing that he recently put together uh, called Macroscope, which comes out on Friday, is an awesome report. This is kind of short term, but also kind of longer term impacts. A lot of stuff even Dominic, you and I talk about, which is the relationship between the U.S., let's just say the U.S. and China, but the U.S. and China and Europe and China, how Apple kind of um, is explaining their relationship with China and the Chinese government and build out in China versus BASF, the German chemical company, um, and kind of their um, their view on maybe they're not looking to decouple, um, whether we think this is a right or wrong strategy. There's also a whole update on our all our researchers' key views, trades, why we think it's it's actually a great report. It was for me, it's actually one of the probably the number one thing I read uh, every week. And then there's you know, we, we didn't talk about ECB, but there's a lot of great stuff that uh, Henry's put out this week. A lot of kind of mixed messages or mixed potential interpretations of what Lagarde uh, meant or, or wanted to, to mean from the from the ECB meeting and, and press conference and what we think, you know, but spoiler alert, overall, for the US and Europe, at least, we, we don't see inflation coming down. And there's only two things that can result in that. Either central banks are more continuing to be uh, extremely aggressive in trying to address it, or the bond market's going to force them to. So if the ECB does not show the same kind of commitment that the Fed, at, Fed has done, I think we'll continue to see probably yields go up faster as we've kind of seen over the last kind of month or two in Europe. And probably see that continue. One of our favorite trades is around Putin. So please, uh, for certainly for our professional clients, check it out. Um, and then I, I listened to it this morning at my son's uh, soccer or football game, uh, Nora Rabini. And you know, for for people who feel like they've they've heard him before, but I would the- say, you know, I think the law was chuckling. Like none of it was particularly positive on the next kind of five years, but. I did think it was super interesting, and he really had some some interesting points. And certainly, if you want to consider what are real risks in in in, in the world in the next kind of three to five years, I think he kind of addressed a, a lot of those things. So I would kind of recommend that as well. So the perfect pre Halloween podcast. Exactly. If you want to be scared, listen to that podcast. Um, and so, thank you as always. Uh, Dominique, this was great and very sorry about last week and showing to everyone you know, who, who's grown accustomed to, to listening to our to our videos every week. And thank you for, for people reaching out, including several people who reached out asking me what happened to the podcast last week. Oh, sorry, that, you know, our week ahead video, which is kind of kind of funny and cool. So thank you. You know, there's tons of more stuff going to come up. I think we're going to try and work on a few kind of more kind of webinar debates uh, like like yours with, with Alex, which was great and continuing to get good feedback. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And good luck, everybody. Good luck. Bye, guys. Bye.